Good morning. After operating a certain way for a year, I'm so used to reading the scripture. <laughs> I'm forgetting that now we have lay participation, and so it's so good to have lay folks reading scripture this morning. Today the sermonic theme is check your motives. Check your motives. Let us pray. Dear Lord, with everything that is happening in the world and even maybe some of the fear that is around us, we are grateful that you have found a way for us to gather together. That you have found a way for us to be present together online and in person, challenging notions of how we experience community. Continue to prick our hearts to work with our conscience and to open our ears, and to open our eyes of understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. How does that sound? So-so? How does that sound? I got two mics. Is that good? Okay. Mega Pastor John Gray bought his wife a Venter uh, SUV Lamborghini a couple years back, retailing for $200,000 for their eighth anniversary. I don't know if that gives you a couple some ideas out there. <laughs> he said he bought it to appreciate his wife. They said that on their eighth anniversary, they wanted to renew their vows and he wanted her to know just how much she meant to him. He says he grew up seeing pastors with first ladies not be good to their wives. He not only is a mega pastor, but some of you know him on the Oprah Network. He's written books, and he speaks around the world. So buying the car was something that he was able to do. And he said this is a husband's blessing, blessing his wife because that's what a man should do with his means. Okay, just don't, don't regurgitate the theology. Stay with me a little longer. He also said people that know them well know that they connected, that they kind of came together over their love for music, their love for people, love for God, church, and guess what? Cars. Within a relatively short time, it also came out that this same pastor, Pastor John Gray, was having what he labels an emotional affair. He says he turned to this other woman for emotional support, but he never had a physical relationship. You know, the larger public crowd thought differently. Many questioned his motive in all of his talk because of this one action. Many questioned, hmm, why did he really buy her the Lamborghini? Was the car purchased out of love or was it purchased out of guilt? Suddenly, the eyes of the crowd looked on, believing the car was a way to appease his wife for cheating on her in the first place. Folks make all kinds of decisions in their lives for different reasons. And while we like to think that people make decisions because they prayed about it and did some spiritual discernment, sometimes the answer is shallow. Our motives are revealed for what they are, and sometimes they are disingenuous. The nice compliment given by another person because they like you. Maybe they overstated how good your meal really was because they had an ulterior motive. Or maybe the busy parent buys their kids toys because they feel guilty about not spending enough time with them. And so they buy out of guilt. Or maybe we buy our spouse a really, really, really super nice gift because we know we've been tipping out to make ourselves feel better about what we do anyway. There's a whole lot of reasons we do the things we do, and our motives sometimes are less than pure. This is where we enter the biblical text today. Last week, Jesus had made two fish and five loaves of bread go a long way. The crowd continued to hang around. The very next day, they noticed Jesus and his disciples were gone. The previous evening, the disciples had gotten in boats and went over to the other side. Jesus had walked over on the water. 
The next day when the crowd begins to stir and look around, they notice that Jesus was gone and so they get into boats and they go to the other side to follow Jesus. Once they get to the other side, they begin to look for Jesus. Eventually they find him and inquire, why did you leave? So why did they follow Jesus? Why did they continue to hang around? Why did they get in the boat and go over to the other side? One could come up with several answers. Maybe, maybe they were hungry. Maybe what they had eaten the previous day had worn off, they had fully digested it. Maybe they wanted to see more miracles. They wanted to see Jesus do more miracles and signs and wonders. Maybe they just wanted to be near this Jesus guy. I'm sure if you think about it for long, you probably could come up with some other reasons regarding why they kept following Jesus. But the speculating stops here because Jesus checks their motives. Yes, in this text today, Jesus checks the motives of the crowd following him. It is Lollapalooza week here in Chicago. It is a well-known music festival with eight stages and 170 bands from all over the world this year, 2021. This event began in 1991 and a host and a variety of genres with the with the word rock in them were featured, with a few hip hop artists thrown in as well, that attracts on average 400,000 people over four days. They say every day about 100,000 people showed up. This year the event sold out quickly before we knew we were dealing with the Delta variant. Lots and lots of people gathered in Grant Park downtown has some Chicago natives concerned. This event for sure draws people. In this day, in Jesus' day and time, also notably, Jesus drew a crowd. Maybe kind of like a Lollapalooza crowd. He had people that followed him around. They were something in this guy, but they couldn't put it exactly into words. They just knew they had to be around him. They had to be in his midst. It takes a little effort to notice Jesus is gone, and then when they notice that, hey, he disappeared, they get in a boat and they follow him over to the other side looking for him. There was something that drew lots of people to him in his day and in his time. Jesus responds rather sharply, almost like maybe he's a little bipolar, to the people who yesterday he fed and have come to see him again. He seems a little annoyed that they are following him. Don't you have something else to do with your day? And you know, Jesus is about to let them have it. You can just kind of feel it in the air. He checks their motives, implying they are following him because of signs and miracles. They want another free meal. He wants more from them, to become more from them than being freeloaders living on miracles alone. He wants them to buy into what he's really offering. Last week I visited Lake Michigan from the Michigan side up by our UCC Camp Tower Hill. It is interesting because at the shore it's a lot of rocks initially and then the decline is kind of sharp. But it's one thing to dip your feet in the water. It's another to submerge and put your whole body in the water. And perhaps Jesus is saying here, I don't want you just to put your feet in. But this call to follow me requires your whole body. It's okay to be moved by signs, but I want something deeper, more abiding, a stronger commitment from the people of God. I want to be your food. I want you to consume me so that you will never be hungry. They were shallow following Jesus with their eyes, but do some of us sometimes follow Jesus with our eyes? What have you done for me lately? Do we follow Jesus to get what we want? To present our list? Do we want Jesus to get our oppressors off our back? Divvy up some vengeance since God said vengeance is mine? Do we follow Jesus for some deeper spiritual meaning? Why are we here? Why do we follow Jesus? Why did we come to church today? What are our motives? You know, like the seven-year marriage that has lost its thrill, sometimes we have to shake up our relationship and our spiritual journey. 
I remember years ago, one of my mentors was saying to me, hey, Charlene, not everybody comes to church because they're in love with Jesus. Many folks are here, but they come for different reasons. Some people come to see their friends. Some people come because they don't have anything else really to do. Some people come because they want to know what's going on. Some people come just to gossip. People come for all kinds of reasons. But my mentor told me, not all of them come because they're seeking this food for a spiritual journey. Sometimes it's good to check our motives. Why do we do the things we do? I've been watching the Olympics. How many of you have been watching the Olympics? A little bit here and there. It's bittersweet. You know, I love looking at the athlete's body. I love looking at people that have trained. But it's also a bit sad when you see people having mental health crisis, or when you see people crying. When you look at someone that's been practicing for years and years since they were a child, take a dive and mess it up royally. When you see someone know that there's no way they're gonna get any medal, that they're at the bottom of the ring in terms of the, um, the ranking system, it seems sad that after all that effort that it comes to this, and you see some people so defeated, so broken. But that's not the road I want to take today. I want to take a different road about the Olympics. Many people come to the Olympics for different reasons. Some come because they're simply good. Their body is good, and it's not really that hard. Some come because they want to beat some score, like the sister from Jamaica who beat another score yesterday evening. Some come because there are expectations from their family. Some come because they represent their country, and there are all kinds of expectations from their country that they have to win. I'm sure there are a whole slew of other reasons why people come to the Olympic, different reasons and motives, and all of that plus a whole lot of human potential that's housed right now in Tokyo, Japan. The bread is great, the fish is better, but your understanding of my purpose is shallow. I came to repair, I came to redeem, I came to restore a broken people. I became because you needed me. I came because it was getting pretty bad on earth. It was getting bad then, it's kind of getting bad now. In a couple of restaurants I visit, they have a peering system for the food and wine. They actually tell you, if you order this dish, this is the wine you should get. That's a great idea because I have no clue what wine I should get with half the dishes I order. If you're going to eat salmon, then you should get white wine. But if you're going to eat that red beef, then maybe red wine is better. And there's even a wine for dessert. When I'm in the wine store, sometimes they have notes with what wine goes well with what. And they give you directions on what food brings out the flavor of the wine. I read somewhere the main goal of pairing is to enhance the food experience. We are at our A game, people of God, when we are paired with Jesus Christ. We excel and do better when Jesus is in our life. We are our best selves when we follow Christ in spirit. We are better paired when we put prayer into our lives. We are our best selves when we gather to be reminded of our Christian identity, our values, and what Jesus said. Paired with Jesus, we will certainly make better choice because our motives will be checked. Because just like Jesus checked the disciples, Jesus checks us. We are our best selves when we embrace the full ministry of Jesus Christ, not just putting our toes in, but our whole, whole body. When we are paired with Jesus Christ, we cannot fail. And when we are not, we are a helpless mess. Usually, when a concert is over, everyone will leave and clear out. But Jesus wants us to linger, to really, really linger. Jesus wants an authentic relationship with each of us. Amen. Today, I'm as we listen to the music, I want you all to reflect on these questions. Why do I come to church? And another question, 
that is harder to answer, why are people no longer coming to church? I'd love for you to sit with those questions and I invite you to listen to the music. Amen.